Well, hey guys, welcome to week four of our study of the book of Jonah. This week we're going to be in chapter two. So if you have your Bibles, open them up and we're going to read this passage in just a second. Last week, uh, Mitchell got us, well, not us, he got Jonah into the great fish. And now we're going to find out what happens to Jonah after he gets swallowed by the great fish. Now, some of you guys may still be wrestling with the validity of the story. How, how does a guy get swallowed by a great fish and then get regurgitated up on dry land, And as we're going to see in the story? I'm approaching this, and Mitchell approached it the same way, that this is a true story. And the reason we're doing that is because Jesus believed it to be a true story. Several different times in the Gospels, we have Jesus in Matthew referring to the story of Jonah, but he doesn't refer it to it as a fairy tale. He refers to it as a real story that happened to a real individual, and he compares his own life to that of Jonah, even stating that the greater Jonah is here, referring to himself. So we're going to act and believe and teach that this is a real story that happened to a real individual. And so we're going to pick it up in chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, read along with me. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O, o Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, this is an interesting passage, this chapter, because it's, it's a prayer. The whole thing is a prayer. It's, it's a prayer of, of thanksgiving. And it's very similar to other prayers of thanksgiving that we see in the Psalms. As a matter of fact, this chapter has um, references, clear references to at least a half a dozen Psalms. Uh, they're almost verbatim. And so Jonah is actually quoting Hebrew scripture as he utters this prayer, this prayer to God. But what we want to do is kind of unpack what's going on. When was this prayer prayed? How was it prayed? Why was it prayed? And what does it reveal about Jonah the prophet? There are a lot of commentators who believe this was a watershed moment in the life of, of Jonah. And they'll come to the conclusion that because Jonah is saved and he's redeemed and he's regurgitated back on dry land and then ends up going into Nineveh, that he's a repentant prophet, that he's sorrow, sorrowful for what he did, the running away, his attempt to get away from God and run to Nineveh. But I think what you're going to see is that nothing could be further from the truth. This prayer, in many ways, is, is false. It, it, it has a certain um, fakeness about it. So let's take a look at it more closely and see if that's true. It says that then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Now this, what this tells us is that this prayer was prayed in its entirety when he was in the belly of the fish. That's exactly what it says. But it starts with the word then. What comes before it? In other words, this is a conjunctive. It's, it's attaching it to something that preceded it. Then Jonah prayed. Well, what prefaced this? You go back to verse 17, which Mitchell covered last week. It says, The Lord appointed, ordained a great fish to do what? Swallow up Jonah. This was the sovereign will of God. He had already had this thing in place. He had created this fish for just this moment. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So it's that that set this whole thing in motion. It, it's that event that uttered the, that caused Jonah to utter this prayer. God caused the fish to swallow up Jonah. So remember what Amos wrote. Now remember, Amos is a contemporary of Jonah. We've looked at this verse before. 
He's a prophet. He's a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, just like Jonah, just like Hosea. And he wrote, without even knowing what was going to happen to Jonah, these words concern, concerning Israel. Even if they, Israel, hide at the very top of Mount Carmel, I will search them out and capture them. Even if they hide at the bottom of the ocean, I will send the sea serpent after them to bite them. Now, here's Amos writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's predicting, prophesying what, what will happen to Israel if they attempt to get away from him, if they attempt to run from him. And for the last four weeks, we've been harping on the fact that Jonah is a symbol of Israel. He represents Israel in this story. And so here he is trying to get away from God, and he's going to go to the bottom of the ocean, as we'll see in just a second, and God will send a sea serpent, a great fish, to bite him, swallow him. There are a lot of people who, who struggle with believing Scripture, and they'll say it's because of stories like this. <clears throat> it's, it's too unbelievable. It's too far-fetched. It's, it's too much of a fairy tale. Well, here's how I look at it. If Jonah or someone else wrote this story about what happened to him, being thrown overboard, being swallowed by a fish. If, if someone wrote that story, and let's say they made it up, and it somehow made it its way into the Scriptures, and then someone like Amos, who, who knows nothing about this story, and writing at a, a different place, writes what he does, that helps me believe that there's somebody other than just a couple of people writing independently. I, I really have a hard time believing that these two people got together and compared notes and said, hey, I'm going to write a story about a guy who gets swallowed by a fish. And so why don't you weave that into your prophecies for the people of Israel? I don't see that happening. That's more far-fetched and hard to believe than this. That God, the sovereign God of the universe, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit caused these men to write things that when put together in the canon of Scripture, all fit together. See, I don't find that as hard to believe as this all being made up by independent people writing independently at different periods of time, and yet when you put it all together, it all makes sense. See, Jonah is living out the fate of Israel. What's happening to him is God's way of illustrating for the Israelites living in Assyria in captivity, why all this has happened to them. See, Jonah is living out their life. He's, he's almost a, a movie to watch. And as you watch the movie, you realize it's a biography of you. Hey, that's me. And that's exactly what these Israelites living in captivity in Assyria are thinking as this story is being read to them, that what's happening to Jonah is, is exactly what happened to us. And so this prayer is going to be really important. Because keep in mind, these people, these Israelites who are living in captivity are living in the belly of the beast, so to speak. They're living in, in Assyria and they're captives of one of the greatest powers in the world at that time. And this prayer of Jonah should strike a chord with them. But sadly, it's going to strike a negative chord, a, a, um, a chord that's not in tune. See, it says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. That, that's a great thing. Jonah's calling out to God. And, and we read that and we think that's exactly what he should be doing. From the belly of the fish, he's calling out to God. And, and then it goes on and says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Now, there's a couple of things going on here that we need to notice. He references the belly of the fish, and then he references the belly of Sheol. I believe those are two different things. They're, they're two different places. But he's calling out to Jehovah, Yahweh. He's calling on the Lord. And then he also refers to him as his God, Elohim. Last uh, Two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that um, the author is using multiple names for God all throughout this book. He refers to him as Elohim, which is the generic name for any God, but it's sometimes also used of Jehovah, the God of Israel. And then he uses Jehovah, Yahweh. And, and what he's trying to show is that there's really two people groups involved here. There's Jonah, 
the Hebrew who represents all Hebrews, all the Israelites. There's the sailors who are all Gentiles. There's the Ninevites who are all Gentiles. And they are another people group. So you have Gentiles and you have Hebrews. And so whenever he refers to the Hebrews, he uses Jehovah. Whenever he refers to the Gentiles, the men on the boat, or the people in Nineveh, he's going to use Elohim. But here, here is Jonah linking the two together because he's recognizing, he's realizing that his God is both Jehovah, the sovereign, eternal God of Israel, but he's also Elohim. And he's crying out. He called out to his Lord. This is the first time we hear Jonah praying to God and, and he's praying because there's been a sudden change in his plans and in his circumstances. Now, what were his plans? His plans were to get on a ship in Joppa and flee from the presence of the Lord by going as far away as Tarshish. See, he's running from God's presence. He wants to get away. And all his plans have changed. God has thrown a wrench into his plans. And he doesn't want to seek God's face, but now he is, right? Now suddenly, because his circumstances have dramatically changed, he's seeking God's face. What had changed? His circumstances. Everything had changed. Look at this. Verse 5 of chapter 1 says, But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship. Everything in this book, every word that's used, every phrase that's written, is intended to convey a message. And that's true right here. See, Jonah, when he got on that ship, paid his fare, got on the ship, he went down into the inner part of the ship. But then later on in chapter 2, verse 17, which we just read, it says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish. See, his circumstances have changed. At one point, he's in the innermost recesses of the ship where he slept, and now he's in the belly of the fish. Things are not as copacetic. They're not as friendly. They're not as um, enjoyable as they once were. That word inner part referring to the, the, bowels, of that the bowels of that ship is, is a word yakare, and it means recesses, innermost parts. It, it's like literally the bowels of the ship. He, he's gone down into the lower parts of the ship where they normally kept cargo. Remember, this is not a passenger ship, but he's found a comfortable place. And he's, he's gotten himself comfortable. He's gone to sleep and he's peaceful. Everything is going great. He's going to get away from God and he's going to go to Tarshish and he won't have to go to Nineveh. He's enjoying this time of rest while the world, these men, these Gentiles are dying around him. So that's his earlier circumstance where he's safe and sound in the belly of the ship but then everything changes. He goes from there to a dramatically different circumstance, to the belly of the fish, to the belly of Sheol. And that word also can refer to the inner parts. So this author is really having a play on words. He went from the inner recesses of the ship to the inner recesses of a fish. And now he's in a place of discomfort. We can only imagine what this must have look, look, felt like and looked like to Jonah to be in the belly of a great fish. And I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time trying to detail what that must have been like because I've never experienced it and I know no one who has. But it couldn't have been enjoyable. But he's literally dying. Now, earlier I said that there's a couple of things going on in this, this prayer. And Jonah's referring to a couple of different circumstances in his life. The first one being he's thrown overboard and he goes into the ocean and he begins to sink like a rock. You remember that uh, children's story I read week one? It, it inferred that he didn't know how to swim. Well, I, I don't know where you get that from this passage. I think the waves and the wind and everything was just so great that he couldn't stay afloat for very long. He, he ran out of strength. He ran out of energy and he began to sink. And it says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, my discomfort. Uh, everything was going south. Remember, all throughout this book, the author has referred to Jonah's descent, his spiral down. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. He's, he's 
getting away from God, or at least trying to get away from God. And now he's been thrown overboard and he's sinking down into the waves. See, I think there's, again, two things going on here. It says that out of the belly of Sheol I, I cry. Now, Sheol is a reference to the grave. And so what Jonah is doing is he's describing what happened when he was thrown overboard and he began to sink. Now, a lot of those children's books uh, portray the fish almost waiting off the bow of the boat for Jonah to be thrown over. And as soon as he hit the water, he was swallowed. I don't think that's what happened. And, and I base that on this prayer. I think what happened once he was thrown over, he began to sink and he began to sink and sink and sink. See, the fish didn't swallow him immediately. He had to sink. He had to continue that descent. See, it says, I'm driven away from your sight. He was going down, and for the Jews, going down, and especially into the depths of the ocean, was a really negative thing because that led to the netherworld. That led to Sheol. That led to death. See, the Jews feared the ocean. They weren't a seafaring people. And the thought of dying in the ocean at sea was something that was incomprehensible to them because no one would ever find your body. And, and it was very important to them for their bodies to be buried. So this whole thing is Jonah trying to describe what he was feeling as he began to sink beneath the waves, as he began to literally drown. See, he's sinking down. He'd gone from sleeping in the bottom of that boat to now he's praying and he's calling out to Yahweh. So what changed his perspective? What changed this? His death, his pending death. He is sinking down into the ocean and he knows he's headed towards Sheol. He's literally drowning. It says that he sank down. And again, that's a reference to Sheol. Everything in this prayer, the, the first half of this prayer is about Sheol. And Sheol is the grave. So when he says the belly of Sheol, he's not talking about the fish. Because as we're going to see, the fish is a form of salvation. It's his drowning that it, what he's referring to as he sinks beneath the waves. See, he is literally drowning. He is sinking down to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. How long is this going to last? We don't know. It can't last that long. He can't hold his breath for that long. But for him, it feels like an eternity. Look at all that he says. You, God, cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. All of these are references to the ocean, not the fish. The sea, the deep, the floods surrounded me. Your waves, your billows passed over me, he says. The waters closed in over me. This is him describing what it felt like to be drowning. The deep surrounded me. Again, these are all references to the ocean, but also references throughout Hebrew scriptures of Sheol, death. And then he says, I went down. He's going down as far as you can go into the sea. All of these are symbols of judgment. And he knows it. He knows he's being judged by God, punished by God. And, and these terms are used, again, throughout the Old Testament. See, God, we know, judged the world by a great flood, a worldwide flood. And only, only Noah and his family escaped that judgment by God. So this idea of the floodwaters, this idea of sinking down into the ocean... The, the waters covering you up is, is a sign of judgment. It's a sign of death. And to the Jews, the, the, the ocean was mysterious. It was scary. It was dangerous. You didn't, you didn't just go out into the ocean. Again, they weren't a seafaring people. Even those stories in the New Testament and the Gospels of the disciples being caught in storms, they feared those storms on the Sea of Galilee because they, became, they could become very intense. And these were seasoned fishermen for the most part, but even they feared death by drowning. And that's why they called out to Jesus, and aren't you going to do something? Aren't you going to save us? See, they, they knew that this was all a symbol of death. And so as Jonah prays this prayer, he's talking about his death. He's drowning. He's going down into the depths. He's headed toward Sheol. And death by drowning was not something they wanted that they would want to embrace. See, I think Jonah had a death wish, but he didn't want to die this way. 
Look at Psalm 69, 1 and 2. Save me, O God, for the floodwaters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. I am in deep water and the floods overwhelm me. So here's, here's this psalm. This is one of the psalms that's referenced in this prayer of Jonah. He doesn't want to die this way. He doesn't want to go into the deep. He doesn't want to head to Sheol. And it's interesting that in the Old Testament scriptures, there's this reference to Leviathan. And uh, again, this is one of those places in the scriptures where, where critics of the scripture will look at it and go, see, this is all make-believe. There's no Leviathan. But Leviathan is, is a symbol of something. Look at Psalm 104, 26. See the ships sailing along and Leviathan, which you made to play in the sea. It's a description of some kind of large sea creature. We don't know what it was. Uh, it could have been a whale. It could have been a large fish. We don't know, but it's a term that's used in the Old Testament. We see this in Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord will take his terrible swift sword and punish Leviathan. The swiftly moving serpent, the coiling, writhing serpent, he will kill the dragon of the sea. Th this term for Leviathan was probably a reference to some kind of sea creature, but it also became a reference to the enemies of Israel. It was a sign of judgment. And so it, it's got multiple meanings in the scriptures. It represents those who are opposed to Israel. It could refer to the Assyrians, to the Babylonians, any of those, those countries that stood opposed to God's chosen people. And to them, it was a symbol of terror, the unknown. One of the reasons Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is because of the unknown. These people were pagans. These people lived far away. All he knew were the stories about them, what he had heard about them doing. And, and as we said week two, they were cruel and merciless and, and they had a PR department that promoted their cruelty in order to scare their foes. So Jonah didn't want to go there. He feared them, but he, now he fears what? The ocean and death by drowning. So in this story, the sea creature, unlike Leviathan, isn't judgment. It becomes salvation. So this great fish it actually becomes the source of Jonah's salvation. It's not judgment. The judgment was him being thrown overboard and then beginning to drown as he sinks into the sea. And that's really important because Jonah seems to understand that in his prayer. He says, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. In other words, he's, he's talking about sinking so low he gets to the base of the mountains which are down in the depths of the sea. That's how far down he's going. He says, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. He's near the point of death yet. Yet, you, God, brought up my life from the pit. God did something. He's under God's wrath. He's under God's judgment. He's beginning to drown He's beginning to die, and yet God brought up my life from the pit. This is, again, a reference to this idea of the grave, to Sheol. It's Shahath, and it means destruction, the grave, hell. He's going down to his end, and I think what's going through his mind is, this is the end. I will now be permanently separated from my God. I won't be seeing him in glory. I won't be going to heaven. I won't be with Abraham and with David. I'm going to Sheol. I'm going into literal hell. And yet God sends this highly unlikely deliverer. He sends this great fish. And the fish becomes salvation, not judgment. That's what I love about this story is that what did Jonah deserve? Judgment. What did Jonah get? Judgment. But just at the moment when he was about to lose his life, God extends mercy and grace and sends this deliverer in the form of this great fish. Now again, we don't know what kind of fish it was, and it doesn't really matter. The fact is, God did a miracle. He created a fish large enough to swallow this man and keep him alive for three days and three nights. You see, Jonah knows that it's God. Jonah is praying this prayer to God. He says, when my life was fainting away, when I was nearing death, 
when I was about to lose it all, I remembered Yahweh. Even in that moment when he was near the end of his life, he calls out to his God. He's, he's about to expire, but he's still praying for mercy. He's praying that God would do something to save him. See, he's, he's reached as rock bottom as you can get. He's literally reached the roots of the mountains. He's sunk down to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. He's near death. And yet, even in that crisis moment, he says, my, pr my prayer came to you. I called and you answered. You heard my voice. What, a, what an incredible, beautiful picture of our God that even at our worst moments, near death, at a crisis in our lives, we can call out and He will hear our prayer and He'll answer. And again, if we stop there, this would be a wonderful story. This would be a wonderful thing, but we're going to see that it's not all it's made up to be. Jonah is not as true in what he says as it appears. See, I think about Romans 10, 11 through 13, and we looked at this two weeks ago. Anyone who trusts in Him, God, Yahweh, will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call, call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here is Jonah, this disobedient prophet who's trying to run from God and refusing to do the will of God, who's being punished by God and sinking down to the roots of the mountain. He calls out to God, and what does God do? God rescues him. God sends a deliverer. God saves Jonah, even though Jonah doesn't deserve it. He gets mercy, compassion, patience, and unfailing love. Remember, the fourth chapter of this book, verse 2, Jonah will complain to God in another prayer and say, I knew if I went to Nineveh and I declared your judgment, they just might repent because you were a merciful, compassionate, patient, and, and a God of unfailing love. And he's just been the recipient of all four of those characteristics of God. Totally undeserved. But God has spared him. He's been delivered and not destroyed. But why is he mad in chapter 4, verse 2? Because God delivered and did not destroy the Ninevites, and it made him furious. See, what's, what we're seeing here is, is, is that Jonah wants to receive because he thinks he deserves it. In spite of his disobedience, he somehow still believes, I deserve to be saved by God because I'm one of your chosen people. I'm not a Ninevite. I'm not one of these pagan sailors. I deserve to be saved. Because look at what he says in verse 8. This is very informative about Jonah and his thought process. This is in the midst of this prayer. These are his words to God. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. What's he talking about? He is making a reference to those sailors who are back up on the ship who he believes are probably still battling the storm. See, he thinks he's better than they are because they're pagans, they're Gentiles, and he's a Hebrew. And it reminds me of the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18. He tells the disciples about a Pharisee who stood over and was praying, and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Arrogance, pride, self-righteousness. That's Jonah. Even as he prays this prayer, he's comparing himself to these Gentile unbelievers. But here's what he doesn't know. And we looked at it last week. They're up on that boat. The storm has stopped. They're calling on Yahweh and they're offering sacrifices and praises and making vows to God. They've come to know Yahweh and they have repented. They have stopped calling out to their Elohims and now they're calling out to the one true God and God has spared them, but not Jonah. See, Jonah says, but with a voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. He's, he's bragging about his righteousness. He's bragging about himself. Look how many times he refers to himself. I, I, I. Here's what I'm going to do. 
It's good that you're going to save me, God, because you're going to need me. I'm going to give you thanks. I'm going to make sacrifices to you. I'm going to make vows and keep those vows. This is the guy who wouldn't do what he was told to do to begin with. And I don't think he meant a word of it. And then he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, if, again, if we stop here and just camp on that one statement coming out of the lips of Jonah, it sounds like he's this repentant prophet who understands that my God is a great Savior. My God is merciful and kind and compassionate. Look at what he did and get, here's what I'm going to do for you because you've saved me. But that's really not the case. See, what he's saying is my salvation, not theirs, my salvation belongs to the Lord. I deserve to be saved. See, he loved being on the receiving end of God's salvation. But here's the point of the story. Was he willing for God to save any? In other words, if he knew that God was in the midst of saving those men on that ship up above, I think he would have been just as angry as he's going to be in chapter 4, verse 2, when God saved the Ninevites. He didn't want those men saved because they were pagans, because they were Gentiles, because they were non-Jews. See, he really doesn't want to see God save any and all. He just wants to be saved. He's happy that God is saving him, that God sent the great fish. But he doesn't want the same thing for others. And again, this reminds me of Romans 9, verses 15 through 16. Listen to what Paul writes. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. See, Jonah didn't deserve God's mercy. Neither did those sailors. The Ninevites didn't deserve God's mercy, but neither did the Israelites. It's God who chooses. And if God wants to save pagan sailors, so be it. If God wants to save the pagan, cruel Ninevites, so be it. If God wants to save Jonah, so be it. As we said last week, this is all about the sovereign will of God and His redemptive plan for the world. God's going to do what He wants to do. And yet we, we seem to see Jonah offering these thanksgivings to God. But here's what's missing. And man, don't let this get by you. See, I don't want you to believe that Jonah's this... Um, reformed individual. He's, he's been changed for life. This, this whole ordeal of drowning and near-death experience and then being swallowed by the great fish, it hasn't really changed him because here's what's missing in his prayer to God. Any confession. He never confesses anything. He never admits any guilt for what he's done. Go back and read it. It's not there. There's no penitence. There's, there's no sorrow or expression of sorrow anywhere in this story on Jonah's part. And there's no repentance. In other words, he never says, I'm sorry, God. I never should have run. I should have obeyed you to begin with. I I'm sorry. I confess it. All he's grateful for is that he's alive. And that's a great thing, right? But that's not confession. Gratitude is a wonderful thing, but in this case, it's not enough. He's grateful to be alive, but he doesn't seem to understand the goodness of his God. See, we go back to two weeks ago when, when, when I said that he's got a warped theology of God. He doesn't understand the ways of God. He doesn't understand the weight of what's just happened in his life, that he was deserving of death. He should have drowned. And yet God rescued him. And he remains, I believe, completely unchanged by any of this. And, and that's what makes this story so interesting. You know, he says, I, I, I'm going to pray towards your holy temple. I'm going to offer you sacrifices. I'm going to make vows. Exactly what the men on the ship are doing, even as he's drowning, and then even as he's rescued and in the belly of the fish. See, he's, he's mirroring a prayer prayed by Solomon. And I think he's doing it on purpose. Back when Solomon built the temple of Yahweh, he had a dedication ceremony and he prayed a prayer. And, and in that prayer, he, he made a series of statements about if we sin, if the people of Israel sin against you, 
Would you promise that if we call out to this place which bears your name, if we call out to the temple, if we turn and face the temple and pray to this temple that bears your name, that you will hear our prayers and you will forgive. And here's Jonah praying in the belly of the fish and he has this prayer in mind, I believe. And it's from 1 Kings chapter 8. Listen to what it says. If they, Solomon says in his prayer, if they, Israel, sin against you, Yahweh, and who has, and who has never sinned, in other words, they're going to sin, you might become angry with them and let their enemies conquer them and take them captive to their land far away or near. Then he goes on. But in that land of exile, in other words, when they are away from your presence, think of where Jonah is. They might turn to you in repentance and pray, we have sinned, done evil, and acted wickedly. If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of their enemies and pray toward the land you gave to their ancestors, in other words, to Jerusalem, towards the temple, towards this city which you have chosen, remember, if they do this in repentance, and toward this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers and their petition from heaven, where you live and uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offenses they have committed against you. Make their captors merciful to them, for they are your people, your special possession. There's none of this in Jonah's prayer. No repentance, no confession. But he wants mercy. He wants his enemy, his captor. He's right now he's captured by this fish. He's in the belly of the fish. It's his source of redemption, but he's still stuck in the belly of the fish. He can't stay there forever. He's still looking for the final phase of his salvation. And yet no confession. And what does it say? Verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now this is, man, don't miss this. I love the fact that when you, when you take the time to study the scriptures and you dig in deeply and you look at the words and you get a concordance and you, get, you use extra helps and you begin to find out what some of these words meant in the Hebrew and in the Greek, it changes everything. You have to stop and ask, why is the author using this kind of terminology? Why does he say, and the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out? That's a very descriptive term, right? I, I, I have a daughter who can't even stand for you to say that word. If you say vomit, she just gets repulsed by it. And, and that's the weight that it carries in this text, that God spoke to the fish, in other words, ordained, commanded the fish to vomit him out after his prayer. Remember, keep the context. He prays this lovely prayer this prayer of thanksgiving, and then God tells the fish to vomit him out. And there's all kinds of pictorial references to this if you want to look them up. There's paintings, there's murals, there's all kinds of um, artistry that's been created over the centuries to portray that very moment. But why does he use the word vomit? Why is he so specific? The word in Hebrew is ko, and it means to literally vomit up, to spew out, to disgorge. Now think about this. Here's this prophet, a Hebrew, just prayed this lovely prayer, and this is what happens to him. I, I don't think this, this is just a coincidence. Nowhere in the Old Testament is this word, ko, ever used positively. It's negative, which you would pretty much infer because it's a negative experience, right, to vomit. So it's got no positive connotations to it, and it certainly doesn't in this context. It's always associated with judgment. Now this guy is getting saved by God, rescued by the fish, but he gets regurgitated, vomited up on dry land. You see, Jonah's got a problem, and God knows it. Jonah's got a heart problem. Jonah's got a worship problem. Jonah's got a God problem. Jonah's got a theology problem. And so God tells the fish to disgorge him. There, there had to be another way. If God can make the fish big enough to swallow this guy, he could have had him exit this fish a different way, but he gets vomited up. And I think there's a reason that this wording is used. One, because it happened. 
But two, it's a statement from God about his understanding of Jonah. Look at Leviticus 18.26. But you shall keep my statutes, speaking to the people of Israel, and my rules, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. This is what God is telling the people of Israel before they go into the land of promise, the land given to Abraham by God and then passed on to his descendants. He says, if you don't obey me, if you don't keep my commandments, and what do we know from the book of Amos and Hosea? They haven't. They're disobedient. They're rebellious. They're idolatrous. They're apostate. They're immoral. They're unjust. And he says, if that's the way you live, I'm going to have the land vomit you out. What just happened to Jonah? Well, he gets vomited out of the fish onto dry land. It's like a reverse. But I think God is, through Jonah, illustrating his displeasure with his prophet, who is a symbol of his people. It says, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. Again, in chapter 18, it says, You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. See, this idea of them being vomited out by the land is a picture of their later capture, defeat and capture by the Assyrians for Israel and the Babylonians for Judah. They're going to be disgorged from the land because of their disobedience, just as Jonah has been disgorged by this fish. And it reminds me of this passage in Revelation where God speaks to one of the churches and he says this about them. He says, I know your deeds. You're, you're, you're neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. They literally make God sick. And I think that's the picture we have of Jonah. He, he makes God sick with his prayer, his pious sounding prayer, his his promise to offer sacrifices, his promises to offer vows and keep those vows. He has no intention of doing any of the above. Oh yeah, he'll go to Nineveh. But as we're going to find out, he's going to go with the wrong intent in mind. And so everything about this story tells me that Jonah's not repentant. Jonah's not confessing anything. He's going to go. He's glad to be alive. And he'd rather go to Nineveh than go back into the belly of the fish or drown. So, yeah, he's going to go, but nothing has changed in Jonah. And we'll see that prove true as we work our way through the remaining chapters. But for your time this week, as you dwell on chapter 2 and think about it and go back and reread it, here's some things I want you to think about. God saved Jonah by having him swallowed by a fish and then unceremoniously spewed onto the beach, vomited out on the beach. Why is this so significant? What is it about that scene that we should notice and take regard of? Secondly, I want you to read Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. What do these two verses have to do with Jonah, and how should they apply to our own lives? I'm not going to tell you anything more than that. I want you to go look at them, think about them, and then consider them. And finally, in what sense does the story of Jonah remind us not to take credit for our own salvation? See, Jonah didn't deserve to be saved, but he was. And even in being saved, he was unrepentant. He was unchanged. See, I can't earn my salvation. You can't earn your salvation. And this story paints that picture so vividly. And I want you just to spend some time thinking about it, talking with others about it, and then figure out how do we apply that to our lives as we live in this world, in this day. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this incredible book, this incredible chapter, and this picture of Jonah that is such a reflection of our lives far too often. Father, would you help us to be those who are truly grateful for your salvation? But Father, more than that, may, may we be truly repentant when we sin against you. May we confess regularly our sins. You've told us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But so often we carry unconfessed sin around like a badge of honor. 
we refuse to confess it, admit it. It's not that you don't know about it. You know you just want us to admit it, confess it. Father, would you this week drive home the story of Jonah into our lives so that we might be true servants of Jesus Christ, salt and light in the midst of a dark and decaying world. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great week and we'll see you in a week. Bye.